How at we as women, how can we expect men to be accountable when we are not holding our peers accountable for the damage that that has been done? That's right. Now here, here's the thing, you know, and I'm gonna ask you guys a tough question. Hopefully Demetri will get back back in here for this one because I want her her to get this into um you know you guys are basically saying many maybe not all i don't know a number you haven't given a number what percentage but there's enough black women out there who have issues that um the brothers are finding it hard to to find women that they could create families with sweet women women who are cooperative feminine that they work with they're basically saying we can't find what we want here in america what argument should i present to them to tell them okay i know that these women aren't ready but you should wait for these black women anyway to get themselves ready is that is that an argument that you would ask would you ask them to wait because that's what a lot of black Americans say, hey, you, you should, even though we have these special set, we got these special set of circumstances, so you just need to wait before you get your family. So get you one of these ladies, clean her up, help her out, get her together mentally and also sometimes physically. Is that what you're telling these young men to do? Or what? You know, um, just like, um, young girls, they're raised up to, oh, a man got to have this. He's got to be tall. He's got to be educated. He's got to have money. Young men need to start hearing that too. So I do not advocate young men to wait on women who are overweight. I do not advocate young men to wait on um, young ladies who have a bunch of babies. You know, um, the young men that I mentor, they know that I have a choice word for these babies what are used in the bible these are bastards you know because they have no fathers you know so i do not advocate men to wait for young ladies to get it together i think they should get someone of their equal that they're compatible with that they can grow with and grow their foundation uh, a lot of these young ladies who, who are overweight have a whole lot of children you know and all that's going on is just a whole lot of drama that they just don't need. They need to be enjoying their lives with someone who are of equal compatibility with them and that's on the same mind level. 
spirituality, physically fit. All right, so Kimberly, you have a son, so I'm gonna ask you a question. Uh, do you want one of uh, these young women that we have we see in the black me? Do you want one of them raising your grandchildren? Um, no, <laughs> you know I, you know Dennis, you and I, you. I grew I'm sorry, up in South I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, hold on. Because uh, no. that wasn't the answer that I didn't. I thought you was going to like work around it and maybe there's some people and there's some good ones out there. You said no. I, let me ask that question again because I don't think I, don't, I was, I was, I was, uh, do you want one of these young ladies in the black community that, that we have now? raising your grandchildren that's the question i asked I'm, I'm ready now go ahead no oh wow dramatization after a car wreck you may have to fight with a highly trained insurance company rep whose job is to knock your damage claim down and out it's a bad idea to enter the ring alone against a trained boxer and it could be be a bad idea to fight against a big insurance company by yourself when the bell rings attorney dennis Sperling will if you've been seriously injured in a car wreck, call me, Attorney Dennis Sperling, at 866-529-2444. That's 866-529-2444. Um, or there's still going to be those eyes, even though, you know, segregation is over, down south, people still rarely mix you see you understand what it's like to be driving down the street thinking maybe i don't have my driver's license a cop pulls up behind you you know how that feels you know how it feels if he looks in the window and he sees you're black you might get tailed for a few blocks he might pull you over that feeling of tension that you have irrespective of the fact that that you're a doctor, irrespective of the fact that I'm a lawyer, we all look, we all fit the stereotype. So my question to you is, Doc, how did it feel in Brazil? You can speak generally, you go down there, describe what you saw, describe how it felt to be around all those black and brown people and you just blended right in. Go ahead and go. That's, that's the first thing I want you to deal with. What's up, everybody? If you appreciate the format and you appreciate what we're doing here, then make sure you can contribute to the Cash App. Make sure you contribute to the PayPal. Make sure you donate to the Super Chat. It's only you and your contributions that keep this thing going. Thanks. We got into the city. We got into Coca Cabana. Um, I did not feel the type of surveillance. I did not feel the kind of hostile uh, environment that we are accustomed to here in the United States, bro. I mean, I felt at home. I felt 
like I belong there, like, like I was raised there, man. I mean, seriously, you know what I mean? And I know that, you know, there are no perfect, you know, uh, um, um, environments and what have you, bro. But, bro, I did not feel like I was a stranger, a foreigner, like I was unwelcome, like I, I was out of place, like I did not belong. And I felt that way uh, the entire time I was there. I was there eight days, and you know I traveled with about thirty black men, and uh, and we were there that whole time, man. And I did not feel like a fish out of water. Not at one moment, bro. I just I felt like I had been there before. You know what I mean, and, uh, and and yeah, it was it was it was a stress free feeling. Just to lay a foundation for everybody, around 191 million Brazilians, uh, 91 million identify themselves as white, 82 million is mixed race, and 15 million as 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 black so technically it's you know this is you might have people who are they call themselves white but in actual reality they're mixed people can say what they want to say but the bottom line is you have almost a hundred million people who are of african descent oh man it was a, it was a, a wonderful feeling feeling rather it was overwhelming um, it, 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 you know, it, again, man, it felt like home, bro. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I did, I had, there was, there was no anxiety or worry on my part. And I, I tell you, man, that stuff, it, it gets into your soul, man, because you feel it. And, and I mean, it's just dramatic. I mean, and, and so you know, you're up in there. I'm up. I'm up in Black Rio, man. And I'm like, hey, you know what? I mean, this is a this is a black culture, black experience. They got they they have their own thing, man. But the average person might not understand what you mean. A typical American thinks America is the center of the world. We're the point of focus. They, you have love, our lovely ladies here will tell you they're the most beautiful women in the world. There are no other women more beautiful than them. They will tell you the rest of the world is copying our hip hop style and saggy pants. And they will tell you all these things, many of whom never even left the country because only 2% of black people have passports. So they've never actually been anywhere else. So in their mind, we're the center of the universe. So please explain to them what you mean when you say nobody cares about what we're doing here in America? Uh, basically, yeah. we're not the point of reference. We are not. We are not the standard. The United States, let me tell you what we have here. We have cold weather. We have mean, ugly, racist people. We have a hostile environment. And we're still getting over this whole Donald Trump phenomenon and everything that happened 20 years mm -hmm. leading up to that. They might want to come visit. They might want to go shopping. They might want to visit California, go to Disneyland, but then they want to go back home. Dennis Rowe. 
If you've been involved in an accident, call me and I'll fight for you. I'm not an actor or a celebrity spokesperson. I'm a real trial lawyer and I've appeared before real judges and real juries on behalf of people with serious injuries. So when I say I'll fight for you, I mean it and I'll back it up. If you've been hurt in an automobile or 18-wheeler accident, contact me toll free at 866-529-2444 and I'll fight for your rights. Hi, my name is Dennis Berlin. I'm not a lawyer, but my daddy is. Yeah. If you've been hurt in a car accident, call my daddy. No need to scream and yell like a little kid. Yeah, I know. My daddy will fight for your rights. Yeah, fight for your rights. If you've been involved in a car accident, call my daddy or attorney in Dennis Sperling. Hello, I'm attorney Dennis Sperling. If you've been injured in a car wreck, call me at 713-229-0770. Call my daddy, daddy, daddy. And they came up with a scam, which was, look, all of these black people at the bottom who want to see something about themselves, let's appeal to their lowest common denominator. So instead of ideating on black men getting ahead, having good jobs, going to college, doing all of this, which was practical because it kept you from getting a 1A and an all expense paid uh, vacation to sunny Nam, well, they started glorifying pimps, hoes, drug dealers, gangsters, murderers, thieves, uh, the whole nine yards of dysfunction, and they've been on that ever since. I saw this, like, for example, when I was the public defender, my white subordinates had a real problem some of them were going into the black neighborhoods and interviewing black defendants and black witnesses yeah, you, all this you know, stuff everybody's worked up about about yeah. police killings yeah lapd killed that many all of them you've heard about over the last four or five years they killed that many in every one or two week period yeah so and, i mean it was a, brutal and you were the we valedictorian you were the valedictorian of Dorsey High School. Now, I graduated from Manuel Arts High School, which is up the street on King I Boulevard. I where it is. And you, you graduated I from Dorsey. I going there, but I wound up transferring to Dorsey. How did you survive the distractions of L.A. in the 1960s with all of the, everything that was going on? And if you can describe it was that. Hard. Yes, sir. It was hard, and still to this day, I cuss. I Hey, what's up, everybody? If you appreciate the format and you appreciate what we're doing here, then make sure you contribute to the Cash App. Make sure you contribute to the PayPal. Make sure you donate to the Super Chat. It's only you and your contributions that keep this thing going. Thanks. Hey, if you're enjoying the content here at Dennis Sperling Unfiltered, make sure you support it by like, sharing, and subscribing to the channel. And also, hit that little notification bell in the corner so that you'll get notice of each and every one of our live feeds. The only time black men are allowed to speak is when it benefits others. So, hey, this is your opportunity to speak. I want to hear from you. And if you want to make this voice louder and clearer, then what you need to do is contribute to the Cash App, the PayPal, and the Super Chat. I appreciate you. Hey, what's up, you guys? This is Dennis Sperling, and I'm back again. And I want to talk to you guys uh, again 
about the history of black men in the U.S. military. And we're going to talk about the Civil War and the, the honorable service that uh, 179,000 black men uh, uh, provided to the United States uh, military on behalf of the Union Army. So the common narrative is that black men just sat, sat by in chains and waited for white boys to come from Massachusetts and New York to set them free from slavery. And that's just far from the truth. We were not um, passive bystanders waiting around for uh, different factions of white men to determine our destiny. We actually participated. And so um, by the end of the Civil War, uh, roughly 179,000 black men or 10% of the Union Army served as soldiers in the U.S. Army and another 19,000 served in the Navy. Nearly 40,000 black soldiers died over, uh, over the course of, um, of the war. Okay, so 40,000 soldiers died over the course of the war, 30,000 of infection of disease, black so and, and another 30,000 from infection and disease. Black soldiers served in artillery, uh, our, I'm sorry, our, artillery and infantry and performed all non combat support functions that sustained uh, the army as well. Black carpenters, chaplains, cooks, guards, laborers. Uh, nurses, scouts, spies, steamboat pilots, surgeons, and teammates, I'm sorry, and teamsters also contributed to the war cause. There were nearly 80 black commission officers. So the thing is, fellas, and before we get started, I want to acknowledge essential entities. Thank you so much for your contribution. Also, thank you for your membership. Guys, the way you keep this stuff going, the way you let me know you appreciate this particular um topic or these topics that I'm talking about here, specifically the military, is by contributing to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. As you see, there's only 22 people here. And if I was talking about Dr. Dre getting divorced and, you know, his wife taking him for $300,000 a, a, a month for the rest of her life in California, and I broke all that down, then uh, I'm sure that I'd have a lot more people here. But I'm taking my time to put this up, you know, and I, I've started with the Revolutionary, actually I started with World War II, and then I jumped back to the Revolutionary War, and now I'm doing the War of 1812. And so now we're doing the Civil War, and then after this we'll do uh, World War, um, well, we, we'll do um, World War I, and then, and then we'll skip ahead past World War II and do uh, Vietnam. But I'm doing this because I know that it's very important. I know that this is something that people will refer to in the future. And um, I think it's important, but the way you can, you show your appreciation for what I'm doing now and your ability to be able to ask questions is simply hit the thumbs up button, hit the number one button. Uh, that'll get the algorithm going. And also brothers, Make sure you contribute to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. So thank you, Essential Entities. Thank you, Will. I appreciate your contributions. So here we go. The issues of emancipation and the military, uh, military service were intertwined from the onset of the Civil War. News from Fort Sumner set off a rush by free black men to enlist in the U.S. military uh, units. They were turned away. That's what happened, right? Right. They initially, they were turned away, right? Remember, this, this is an ongoing and repeating theory. Remember that? Initially, they were turned away in the Revolutionary War. They were turned away in the War of 1812. It wasn't until they started getting beaten badly by their opponents, all of a sudden, the U.S. military and the Navy said, well, we need to get those black guys in here. This is an ongoing theory. They need us until they don't. <laughs> they don't need us. I'm sorry, they don't need us until they do need us. This is something that's been ongoing, right? And the thing is, they are not able, the U.S. Army is not able to win its wars without the help of black men. 
which I just find both interesting and ironic, even wars uh, for its freedom and wars for the freedom of uh, a black men they, uh, and women. They couldn't, they couldn't win on their own. They had to get the help of, of black men, you know, but, but again, initially, as always, they turned down our help. And so um, we know how that story ends. At a certain point, they'll, they'll say, um, we need to get some of these black guys in, right? So here's they were turned away, however, because of federal law dating from 1792, uh, barred Negroes from bearing arms for the US Army. Although they had served in the American Revolution and in the War of 1812. So basically, they had a law in the books saying that uh, we don't want black guys helping. We put that in, in the books in 1792, about 12 or so years after uh, the American Revolution, after they used us uh, for the American Revolution. Remember, they had to do that because the British were enlisting black men. And so the, 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 the uh, Americans said, well, well, we'll promise you freedom, too. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll promise you freedom. We'll let you free. And so they, they got about 5,000 black men that were convinced that they were going to let them go free, even though at the end of the day, uh, many of those men were tricked. Um, they realized their service was for nothing. Um, they were not fighting for either side. They were fighting for their own freedom. And that's basically how that went. Um, but in the meantime, let's go ahead and continue. Uh, you know, although they had served in the American Revolution and the War of 1812, um, in Boston, disappointed would-be volunteers met and passed resolution requesting that the government modify its laws to permit uh, their enlistment. The Lincoln administration wrestled with the idea of authorizing the recruitment of black troops, concerned that such um, a, move, a move would prompt the border states to secede. Um, when General John C. Fremont uh, in Missouri and General David Hunter in South Carolina issued proclamations that emancipated slaves in the military regions and are and permitted and permitted them to enlist, their superiors sternly revoked their orders. By mid 1862, however, the escalating number of former slaves, contrabands, and declining number of white volunteers and the increasingly pressing personal needs of the human army pushed the government to reconsider its ban. In other words, again, they needed us. They didn't want us until they, they needed us. And then they basically brought us in by droves. That's basically what happened there. All right. As a result, um, let me see. Uh, as a result, on July 17th, 1862, Congress passed the second Constitution confiscation and militia act, freeing slaves who had masters in the Confederate army. In other words, so now we're just going to free the slaves whose um, masters decided to take up arms against um, the United States Army. So you're, you're in Georgia somewhere, you're in South Carolina, your master decided to join the, join the Confederate army. Well, you know what? You're you're gonna we're gonna let you join the military. We're gonna let you join the U.S. Army. That's basically how that went. And so, you know, you had to basically what what was basically going on. It was like a spit in the face. This is your punishment for joining the Confederate Army. That's that's what that was about. But I thought that was interesting in itself. But in the meantime, I want to get back to the story. I was just actually looking for something else that I thought was important. So. Um, Let's continue here. Um, two days later, slavery was abolished in the territories of the United States. And on July 22nd, President Lincoln presented a preliminary draft of the Emancipation Proclamation to his cabinet after the Union Army turned back Lee's first invasion of the North, uh, of the North uh, in, in Maryland. And the Emancipation Proclamation was subsequently announced black recruitment was pursued in earnest. In other words, they went after all the brothers they could after telling you they didn't want you. Uh, 
you know, for about two years into the war. Now they're like, ah, we want them all. Volunteers from South Carolina, Tennessee, Massachusetts uh, filled the first authorized black regiments. Recruitment was slow until black leaders such as Fred Frederick Douglass uh, encouraged black men to become soldiers to ensure eventual full citizenship. Two of Douglass's own sons contributed to the war effort. Volunteers began to respond and in May 1863, the government established the Bureau of Colored Troops to manage the burgeoning number of black soldiers. By the end of the Civil War, roughly 179,000 black men. That's 10 percent of the Union Army served as soldiers in the U.S. Army and another 19,000 served in the Navy. Nearly 40,000 black soldiers died over the course of the war. 30,000 and, and 30,000 died uh, uh, from infection or disease. Black soldiers served in artillery, the infantry, and performed all non-combat uh, uh, all non-combat support functions that sustain an army, as well as black carpenters, chaplains, cooks, guards, laborers, uh, nurses, scouts, spies, steamboat pilots, surgeons, teamsters, and the teamsters somebody who drives horses uh, also contributed to the war. There were nearly eighty black commissioned officers. Black women who could not formally join the army, nonetheless served as nurses, spies, scouts, and most famous was Harriet Tudman, uh, who, who, who scouted for the second South Carolina volunteers. So that's something that people never tell you. They, people think that Harriet Tudman was just, uh, you know, she's just this black woman who, you know, led the um, Underground Railroad, but in actuality, she was also a spy. She was actually used as a spy uh, for the Union Army, she can get in and out. Just imagine, she knew how to get in and out of those places because she'd been on the Underground Railroad, you know, working, bringing slaves. So she knew how to hide out, where to go, and these other sort of things. So, you know, that's something that we should consider. That's history about her. Um, Pablo Fres Frescobar says, Dennis, I have a special Civil War document I want to share with you when you're ready for guests. Okay, cool, no problem. I'll, I'll, I definitely want to get that in. Uh, and Randall says, uh, always here for the history lessons. Cool, man. Thank you so much. You guys appreciate this. Make sure you contribute to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. Uh, and also hit the like button. Again, this is not one of those uh, conversations where there's going to be a whole lot of people who join. You know, So I need you guys to show your support because otherwise it makes this not worth it. Okay? So I need you guys to make sure you show your support. Um, for what I'm doing here, you know, it, it, you know, I, I, I know it's possible for the guys that are here today to, to show your support by contributing to the super chat, the cash app and the PayPal. So you guys go ahead and do that, whether it's five dollars, two dollars, three dollars, twenty dollars. And also make sure you hit the number one button that keeps the comments going. And uh, the other thing is, you know, this is for you. And I do this because people often say that black men don't build this, is that black men haven't contributed anything to the United States other than being slaves or playing football. And that's just not true. What I've shown you so far is that we fought in every war since the beginning of this country. We fought in the, the, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, which was we were crucial in that. And, uh, you know, the United States was, you know, a hair away from losing its its country against the British. So keep that in mind. So if it wasn't for black men, remember the British in the War of 1812, you know, the British were basically hiring, not even hiring, said black man, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you freedom if you help us take our take our country back. That's what the British said in 1812, and black men signed up by droves. And so keep that in mind. We were crucial in that. Slavery was crucial. We were crucial. But um, anyway, because of prejudice against them, black units were not used in combat as extensively as they might have been. Nevertheless, the soldiers served with distinction in a number of battles. Uh, black infantrymen fought gallantly at Milkins Bend in Louisiana, Port Hudson in Louisiana, Pittsburgh, uh, uh, Pittsburgh Virginia, and Nashville, Tennessee. The July 8th 1863 assault on Fort Wagner, South Carolina, in which the 54th Regiment of Massachusetts volunteers lost two thirds of their officers and half of their troops 
was memorable was was memorably dramatized in the film Glory. By the war's end, 16 black soldiers had been awarded the Medal of Honor. 16, right? That's amazing. In addition to the perils of war faced by all Civil War soldiers, black soldiers faced additional problems stemming from racial prejudice. Racial discrimination was prevalent even in the North and the discriminatory practices permeated the US military. Segregated units were formed with black enlisted men and typically commanded by white officers and black non-commissioned officers. So you'd have a black, a white lieutenant and a black uh, and a black sergeant, the sergeant being an uh, NCO, non-commissioned officer, a lieutenant being an officer. They were higher rank. Uh, the 54th Massachusetts was commanded by Robert Shaw and the first South Carolina uh, by Thomas Wentworth Higgins, both white. Black soldiers were initially paid $10 per month, from which $3 was automatically deducted for clothing, resulting in a net pay of $7. In contrast, white soldiers received $13 per month, from which no clothing allowance was drawn. In June 1864, Congress granted equal pay to the U.S. colored troops and made the action retroactive. So that means the brothers got a big check. They were even trying to stiff the brothers on the money they were giving them, man. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? This is what black men did. So you got 179,000 black men being underpaid. Okay, just think about that. And so all of a sudden, in, in, in you know, in in, in 1864, co Congress gave they fought so well, they were so vital to the war effort. Congress decided to pay the brothers all their back pay. You see what I mean? Uh, I mean, you know, the thing is, man, and I'm going to just take a quick break here. You brothers, man, have proved black men, black American men, you have proved yourself over and over again. I had a dude come on here a couple of weeks ago, and this guy, you know, he's a Haitian brother, right? And he said his daddy or whoever told him that all black men, all black people ever did was beg. He said all we ever did was beg white people to give us rights, beg white people for that. This is what these, this is the perception. You see, the perception is all black people do is put signs up and beg white people. That's not, we've earned it through blood, sweat and chip. We weren't, even when we were slaves, we were fighting with white people. We brought them to the point where they realized we gotta let these Negroes free or they gonna kill all of us. They realized that no matter what was going to happen, we were eventually going to, we were going to continue fighting and it was never going to be over. The only reason folks in Haiti won in, in the Caribbean is because they had them beat 20 to one. In other words, you got 20 black folks, 20 angry Haitians, 20 angry Africans in, in the island of Haiti and to every one white person. Yeah, eventually they were going to slaughter. Them. Eventually that was going to happen. Here in the United States, we've always only been about 10 to 13 percent of the population in total. But there were some places where we outnumbered the whites. So in a situation like that, they said, well, we got maybe we can work around this by having some on white enclaves. That's what the whole Georgia territory was about. Georgia was initially an all white colony. Uh, of, 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 of well, all white British, it was all white colony, it was all white state basically, but that didn't work because they couldn't get white folks to work in the fields. And then on top of that, you created some kind of uh, classism going on. Now you got the white people in the house and then you got the white people working in the fields and that created a problem. And see, the other thing you got to understand is the Spanish who owned Florida, who ran Florida, had been arming black men in Florida for hundreds of years. And many of those uh, black men in Florida came from Cuba. Cuba being a Spanish territory, many of those uh, uh, um, Spanish, many of those Africans were actually from the Congo. So they spoke Portuguese and they were Catholic. And so the Spanish at the time aligned with men who were Catholic. It, it was the Europeans who came in and said, we're going to empower white people. And what did that do? That was a broad net. That could include 
uh, Irish, Scottish, Southeastern, uh, Southeast, uh, South, Eastern European, all of those people who consider themselves white, they would all fall under that white banner. They weren't giving guns to black people. The Spanish, on the other hand, were willing to give guns to black people. So you got you got South Carolina, where you got all these slave uprisings going. You got Georgia acting as a buffer state between Florida, where you got all these armed black men. And so what I'm trying to tell you is we have been fighting and fighting and fighting. White people couldn't sleep at night because they were afraid of being waking up to a big black angry mob of people in their bedroom stabbing and hacking them to death. So they eventually knew slavery was going to end. We did not lie by uh, or sit by quietly and allow slavery to happen. We fought every day of the week, every step of the way. And it's documented. It's well documented. The whole point of the Revolutionary War was that the, the colonies did not like the fact that the British were trying to end slavery because they realized it was a failed experiment because just, you can't keep these people enslaved. They had been getting beat up and rooted and routed. And so they were in, they, they had some cases, they had a case in Europe, a, a case in Great Britain where a slave was set free. And, 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 and the colonists recognized that they're eventually gonna do that to the Caribbean and then they're also going to do that to the United States, and they wanted to keep their slaves. But the but the the uh, and on top of that, the British were beginning to arm their African uh, or African men who African men and call them the Ethiopian regiments and placing them in North America. And so the, so the colonists look around and said, "Nah, hell no, nah. we got to have a revolution because the last thing we want is more of these black folks armed." They clearly don't care about us. They, it was out of fear and the need to keep slavery intact that the Revolutionary War was fought. Gerald Horn says that. Dr. Gerald Horn of U of H, I put his videos up. I'll put the link in the chat room um, for you guys to check out. But what I'm saying is for people who think that black men sat by idly and waited for white people to give them their freedom, that is a damn lie. As, as, as the stats show, 179,000 black men fought. Now, you got to understand something. 179,000 black men, there was only 400,000 black people in the United States at, at, the, at that time. I'm sorry, there was only 4 million black people in the United States. So think about it. Cut that in half, it's about 2 million black men, right? More or less. All right. And so 200. So 10% of the black population at the time, more or less, 10% of the army, 10% of our whole population fought. Only 600,000 men fought and died in the military alone. So if you had 70,000 of them being black, what does that tell you? I mean, what does that tell you? And those are just the numbers that we, we hear about. A large percentage of them were black men. So we didn't sit by idly. Nobody, nobody gave us our freedom. We fought for it. We fought for it when presented that we begged to join. And then when presented with the opportunity to join, we joined in droves. So don't let them steal that glory away from you, brothers. Don't let them steal that glory away from our black. And, and, and again, it's great to know about African history. And that's a wonderful thing to know. And I support that 100%. But it's, if we're talking about black American men, you have a closer relationship to these black men that some of, some of them were your granddaddies or great granddad. Some of them were your grandmothers, grandfathers. Some of them were your great grandfather, great grandmothers and grandfathers, grandparents. These are our people. These black men put it all on the line for you. And so you got to remember that. Do not let them steal your glory. Never let anybody sit up and tell you that black men didn't participate in their own freedom heavily. And if it wasn't for the black men fighting in the Civil War, the North would have lost. They were getting wore out by them Southerners. You fighting these swamp running white boys on their territory and you from Connecticut, you're not even used to the heat. Look, look at what's happening. They're not even used to the heat. And so it wasn't until black men who are used to the heat, who can handle it, came down and began to turn the tide of the Civil War. But before that, it was going to be a lost cause. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. And, and, and look, let me tell you something. 
those white Southerners were afraid of those black troops because those black troops showed them no mercy and no quarter. They, it, was, it was the brothers were fighting for their lives, literally, and their freedom and the lives of their families. So keep that in mind. And they did it by dealing with racism. They they did it. They did. This is how they dealt with it. You know, not like they went in there and had a hunky dory time. They had to deal with with um, <laughs> you know inequality even on the team they were fighting on behalf of. So you know, hit the number one button, man, for the Civil War veterans, man. All these black men. Y'all remember that 179,000. That's the only number you have to memorize. 179,000. That's how many black men served in the military. Okay, during during the uh, during the revolution. Uh, I'm sorry, during the Civil War. Keep that in mind. But um, in the meantime, I want to get back to reading this reading that I put together for you guys. I want to make sure we don't forget that. But 179,000. Okay. That in mind, fellas. Um, so, oops. All right. So, um, the black troops, however, faced great peril, uh, faced greater peril than white troops when captured by the Confederate Army. In 1863, the Confederate Congress threatened to punish severely officers of black troops and to enslave black soldiers. As a result, President Lincoln issued General Order 233, threatening reprisal on all Confederate prisoners of war for any mistreatment of black troops. Although the, the threat generally restrained the Confederates, black captives were typically treated more harshly than white captives. In perhaps the most heinous known example of abuse, Confederate soldier, soldiers shot to death, black Union soldiers captured at Fort Pillow, Tennessee, engagement in 1864. Confederate General Nathan Bed, Bed, uh, Bedford Ford witnessed the massacre and did nothing to stop it. Okay, think about that. This is a Confederate general. And the crazy thing is, man, I got a goddamn uh, street right near my house named. Uh, uh, Forest Avenue, or Nathan Bed, it's named after this dude. And this is this savage, this is what this bastard did. So um, I'm gonna actually, now that I, you know, I've been dealing with this, I'm gonna have to actually petition my uh, my uh, local council to get that asshole's name off of my uh, street sign here. But oftentimes many of those signs, and I try to have this conversation with you guys yesterday or a couple of days ago, maybe at this point, symbolism means something, you know, you the sign up of, uh, you, you name a street after somebody like Nathan Bedford Forrest and you put it in the neighborhood What that basically is saying is Negroes aren't welcome here, you know, so symbols mean something. We were talking about this in the context of Colin Kaepernick taking a knee, right? But symbols do mean something, fellas. So don't never let these people make you think symbols don't mean something. They do. And, and naming somebody uh, Nathan Bedford Forest Avenue actually means something. So y'all keep that in mind. Um, but in the meantime, I want you guys to uh, talk about, if you appreciate what I'm doing, make sure you hit the number one button. I need you guys to show your appreciation by hitting that number one button. Um, I want to make sure that, that we know that I know that you guys appreciate what I'm doing here by hitting the number one button. That's the best thing you can do for me right now and uh, do it for the algorithm, fellas. Now, lastly on this, so we're learning a little facts here. Um, the document feature with this article is OK. So I want to show you guys an article here. Well, let me see if I can blow it up for you. So this is an article used to recruit. Um, let me see if I can get this pulled up real quick. This is an article used to recruit black men into the military uh, during the Civil War times, right? So you guys can take a look at that when it comes up.
Oops. You can see this clearly. Hit the number one button if you can see this clearly. Okay. It says to colored men, freedom, protection, pay, and call to military duty. On the first day of January, 1863, the president of the United States proclaimed freedom to over 3 million slaves. This decree, because remember, there's 4 million black people in America, but about half, what they're saying is about 25% of them or one quarter of them were already free. So that's another thing you need to keep in mind. You know, not all, all the black people here in the United States were enslaved. This decree is to be enforced by all the power of the nation. On the 21st of July last, he issued the following orders, protection of colored troops. And this just kind of goes into, you know, what, you know, it goes into uh, what black men, uh, you know, they needed you in there, you know. But uh, you guys contribute to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to prep this video that I have here that I want you guys to see. Uh, but in the meantime, I also want to tell you about a few Civil War heroes, right? But um, before I go in, you know, um, on January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. All person held as a slave within any states in the room. Okay, so this is the thing about the Emancipation Proclamation. It was a legal document freeing all the slaves in the southern states. All right. So what that means is there were slaves in in the rebel states, the states in the states that are rebel. So there are people who had slaves in the northern states. So technically they weren't free, right? But they but this Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves um, in 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 the southern states. Now the crazy thing is, Native Americans had slaves too. <laughs> okay, the so-called five civilized tribes. They held slaves too, and they were fighting against the Union Army. They were sided up with the Confederates to fight the Union Army. So, you know, all you guys talk about stuff like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm half Chickasaw. You know, I'm half, uh, I'm from Papa Ho. Uh, uh, I'm from Twerk It Den. You know, I'm a Twerk It Den Indian. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a Slap a Ho Indian. I'm a, 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 a Cherokee. You see what I'm saying? Um, yeah, y'all might actually uh, not be, but your people lived on a, a, a reservation and had these customs because your people were enslaved by the Indians. So again, as Dr. John Henry Clark said, black people don't have friends, not like that, okay? So just keep that in mind. All you guys who say, oh yeah, we were Indian, we were, you own the plantation, but you were the help. So let's keep that in mind too. Now there is some interbreeding, but very rarely. The the DNA set tests say that only about one to two percent of black folks actually have uh, Native American DNA in them. For the most part, you were the help. All right, that's how that went. So let's keep that in mind. All right. Um, more than more than the more than one million enslaved people in the loyal border states and in the Union occupied parts of Louisiana, Virginia, were not affected by the proclamation, okay? So all of you guys who are uh, celebrating Juneteenth in Louisiana and them border states, you wasn't free, okay? The Emancipation Proclamation didn't, it didn't free you, okay? You didn't get free till the war was over. Uh, let's see, for the first, and that was after they actually abolished slavery with an actual amendment to, to the, uh, to the Constitution because the proclamation was a wartime power given to uh, President Lincoln, all right? But that was not the law, it was just the wartime power given to him. So that's the way to that. Had the war ended, that, that you know, it would have resolved, right? It would have been over. Now, black soldiers have fought in the Revolutionary War and unofficially in the War of 1812 but state militias had excluded African-Americans since 1792. The U.S. Army never accepted black soldiers. The U.S. Navy, on the other hand, was more progressive, and their uh, African-Americans had been serving as shipboard uh, firemen, steward, coal heavers, and even boat pilots since 1861. So at this time, I want to tell you guys about Robert Smalls, okay? Now, Robert Smalls was a dynamic 
sailor. He was a man that escaped slavery by stealing a Confederate boat and sailing it to the north, right? This is what he did. Uh, Robert Smalls, April 5th, 1839, February 23rd, 1915. This man died in 1915. This man literally could be somebody's granddaddy right here. That's what I'm telling you. He, if most of y'all, if, you if you're 40 some years old, your grandma was born in 1905, 1920. That means your mother, this that woman was alive. This could be your granddaddy right here. This could be your granddaddy's. Uh, th this could be your 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 grandmother's grandfather, or it could be your grandfather's great grandfather. This is who this could be. This is how close this is in proximity to you, a a as we stand here today. Uh, he was an American politician, a publisher, a businessman, a maritime pilot born into slavery. So what we're going to do is we're going to dig down deep into what he actually did. Now, he escaped from slavery. How did he do it? In April 1861, the American Civil War began with the Battle of Fort Sumner in nearby Charleston Harbor. In fall of, of 1861, Smalls was assigned to steer the CSS Planner, a lightly armored Confederate military transport under the command of Charleston District Commander Brigadier General Roswell S. Ripley. Planners' duties were to survey waterways to, to, lay, to lay mines and to deliver dispatches, troops, and supplies. Smalls piloted the planner throughout the Charleston Harbor and beyond on area rivers along the South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida coast. So this man, basically the, the, the Confederates had this black man steering a boat for them. This boat right here. So you have black people on both sides of the uh of the war of the civil war isn't that crazy right and that's what they do they get us fighting on both sides and they promise the ones that are fighting on their back i'm gonna let you free when you get i'm gonna let you free when you when we win charles uh 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 uh, uh. you see what i'm saying from charleston harbor smalls and the planner crew could see the line of the federal blockade ships in the in the outer harbor seven miles away Smalls appeared content and had the confidence of the planner's crew and owners. At, and at some time in April 1862, so this is about a year after the war starts and about six or seven months after he'd been piloting this boat, Smalls began to plan an escape. He discussed the matter with all the other slaves in the crew except one who he didn't trust. He didn't trust that sellout, so he didn't tell him about it. On May 12th, um, 1862, the planter traveled 10 miles southwest of Charleston to stop at Coles Island, a Confederate post on Stono River, and was being dismantled. There, the ship picked up four large guns to transport to, to a fort in Charleston Harbor. Back in Charleston, the crew loaded 200 pounds of ammunition and 20 cord of firewood onto the planter. On the evening of May 12th, the planter was docked as usual at the wharf below General Ripley's headquarters. Its three white officers disembarked to spend the night ashore, leaving Smalls and the crew on board, as, as was the common uh, custom. So, so that they, it was full of ammo. Uh, the white boys went to go to the local bar to have them a drink, go home and chill. And so they left all the black people on the boat, okay? They left the black slaves who was the crew on the boat. After three Confederate officers were court-martialed, okay, that was a custom, that's what they did. After three Confederate officers were court-martialed and two convicted, but the verdict were later overturned, before the officers departed, Smalls asked Captain Relia if the crew's families could visit, which was occasionally allowed, and he approved on condition that they depart before crew, before curfew. When the families arrived, the men revealed the plan to them. <laughs> So basically, these black men were forced to sleep on this boat. And uh, these white boys left to go hang out in town. And he said, can we have our people? Can our people come visit us? Uh, and he said, yeah, they can come. But curfew, you know, whatever, maybe the curfew is at 12 o'clock, 10 o'clock. I don't know. And he said, yeah. So the family came and then he let them know what the plan was. This was the first. This was the first the woman and children heard of it. So he didn't even tell his woman what he was doing. All right. Put a number one in the air for Robert Smalls for keeping it secret. 
hit the, give me a number one, y'all. Make sure you hit the number one button. I appreciate it if you guys do that. Make sure you contribute too to the super chat, the cash app, and PayPal. Um, uh, and by the way, Robert Small's wife, she was significantly older than he was. Uh, this was the first time. This was the first the women and children heard of it, although Smalls recently had told his wife, Hannah, she had known that Smalls longed to escape, but, had realized, but hadn't realized that he was formulating the plan and intended to execute it. She was taken aback, but quickly regained her composure and told him, it is a risk, dear, but you and I and our little ones must be free. I will go for where you die, I will die. That's a dedicated woman. The other women were least less steadfast. Ah! They cried and screamed, and when they learned that they, they had stumbled into, and the men struggled to quiet them. So you got a bunch of broads on the goddamn, but I don't want to be free. I want to go back to master. I want to stay here. This is what, and so the men had to say, shut up, be quiet, cut your mouth, you know, be quiet, shut up. Uh, later, once the shock had worn off, those women admitted they were glad for the chance of freedom. Look at that. So these men said, y'all come on the boat, come visit us. And once they got on the boat, they set sail and, and set free. And the women were screaming and hollering, and ah, we don't want to go. Isn't that something? You got a chance to escape slavery, and these women, these women don't want to leave. Look at that, man. Boy, I tell you, they wanted to stay there with Master. But this is this is the Civil War. This is Robert Smalls. At some point, crew members pretended to escort family members back home, but circled around and hid aboard another steamer uh, docked at the North Atlantic Wharf at about 3 a.m. May 13, Smalls and seven of the eight slave crew men had their previously planned escape to the Union blockade ships, but uh, made their previously planned escape to the Union blockade ships. Smalls put on the captain's uniform and wore a straw hat similar to the captain's. He sailed the planet past what was then called the Southern Wharf and stopped at another wharf to pick up his wife and children and, and the families of other crewmen. Smalls got the ship past uh, the five Confederate harbor forts without incident as he gave the correct signals at the checkpoints. In other words, he put the captain's uniform on, pretend he was captain, and he gave him whatever right signals he's supposed to give. And, and, and you know, I mean, this is a bold man, you know, 3 a.m. in the morning, they fake like they walked their families home and then bust back and got back on the boat. Smalls guided the ship past the five Confederate harbor forts without incident as he gave the correct signals at the checkpoints. The planner had been commanded by Captain Charles C. J. Relia and Smalls copied Relia's manners and straw hat on deck to fool the Confederate onlookers from the shore uh, and the forts. The planner sailed past Fort Sumner at about 4.30 a.m. As nearly, as nearly free as the nearly free slaves approached Fort Sumner, their apprehension began to grow. It was the most heavily armed of the forts intended to be manned by the most suspicious soldiers. One of the men aboard later said, when we drew near the fort, every man but, but Robert Smalls felt his knees giving way and the women began crying and praying again. Boy, that was a hell of a ride. That was, you know, as a, that's the love boat right there, man. As Planner approached the fort, but but Robert Smalls was cool as a fan. This is the man you're dealing with, man. Cool under he is the Captain Kirk of of of, of the black uh, of, of black history, straight up. As the Planner approached the fort, several men urged Smalls to give it a wide berth. Smalls refused, saying that such a behavior would almost certainly arouse suspicion. He steered the ship along its normal path, slowly, as though he were merely enjoying the early morning air and in no particular hurry. When Fort Sumner flashed the challenge signal, Smalls again gave the correct hand signs. Uh, there was a long pause. The fort didn't immediately respond, and Smalls now expected cannon fire to shred the planter at any moment. Finally, the fort signaled that all was well, and Smalls sailed his ship out of the harbor. Look at that. Uh, the alarm was only raised after the ship was beyond gun range. Rather than turn east towards Morris Island, Smalls had headed straight for the Union Navy fleet, replacing the rebel flags with a white bed sheet, which was brought by his wife. The planter had been seen by the USS Onward, which was about to fire until the crewmen spotted the white flag. In the dark, the sheet was difficult to see, but the sunrise uh, arrived, which allowed uh, the viewing. 
All right, so think about that, fellas. Now, he went on to have a service in the union. Smalls having just turned 23. This man was 23 years old and did all this. 23 years old. 23, some of y'all are barely getting out of junior college at 23, right? <laughs> he was 23 years old. Smalls, having just turned 23, quickly became known in the North as a hero for his daring exploit. Newspapers and magazines reported his actions. The U.S. Congress passed a bill awarding Smalls and his crewmen the prize money for the planter, valuable not only for its guns, but, its, but also its low draft in Charleston Bay. Southern newspapers demanded harsh discipline for the Confederate officers who, whose joint shore lead had allowed the slaves to steal the boat. <laughs> right? Uh, Small's share of prize money came to $1,500, equivalent to $38,885 in, in 2021. Immediately, after the capture, Smalls was invited to travel to New York to help raise money for ex-slaves. But Admiral DuPont vetoed the proposal, and Smalls began to serve the Union Navy, especially with his detailed knowledge of mines laid near Charleston. However, with the encouragement of Major General David Hunter, the Union commander at Port Royal, Smalls went to, uh, and I think Port Royal is actually down in Jamaica, uh, Smalls went to Washington, D.C. in August 1862 with Reverend Mansfield French, a Methodist minister who had helped found Wilberforce College, HBCU, in, in Ohio and had been sent by the American Missionary Association to help former slaves as, at, at Port Royal. They wanted to persuade Lincoln and the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, to permit black men to fight for the Union. OK, again, although Lincoln had previously rescinded orders by Hunter and Generals Fremont and Sherman to mobilize black troops. Stanton soon signed an order permitting up to 5,000 African-Americans to enlist in the Union's forces at Port Royal. Uh, those who did were organized, I guess it's not in, in Jamaica, but I know there's a Port Royal in Jamaica, but it's obviously not. Um, those who did were organized as the first to second South Carolina regiments colored Smalls worked as a civilian with the Navy until March 1863 when he was transferred to the Army. By his own account, Smalls was present at 17 major battles and engagements in the Civil War. After capture, the planner required some repairs which were performed locally and went into Union service near Fort Pulaski. The boat was valued for a shallow draft compared to other boats, in the, which means it could ride up in, in, in low water. That's what that means, man. Um, but let's kind of read a little. Smalls was made pilot of the uh, Crusader uh, under Captain Alexander Wren. In June of that year, Smalls was piloting the Crusader uh, in Edesto in Wadmelo Sound when the planner returned to service and an infantry regiment uh, engaged in the Battle of Simon's Bluff at the head of Edesto River. He continued to pilot the Crusader and the planner as a slave. He had, had assisted in laying mines, then called torpedoes. So they got the slaves, they got the black slaves out there laying mines. And see, the other thing you got to understand, white men didn't do much of anything back before the Civil Wars. They didn't do much. They didn't have the skill set. They didn't do the building. They didn't do the building of roads. They didn't build houses. They didn't do anything. So it makes sense that you would have to get somebody like uh, uh, this man, uh, Robert Smalls, to do all this technical stuff because white men didn't have skills back then. It was literally black men who built everything technologically savvy in the United States at the time, because white men, I mean, they were the ones that had the skill set because they were the ones doing all the work. Um, now as a pilot, he helped find and remove them and serve and service the blockade between Charleston and Beaufort. He was also present when the planter was fired upon at several fights at Adams Run. Uh, and on the Dwayo River and the battles of Rockville at Jones Island and the second battles of, of Pocatiglago, I can't say that name. So anyway, this man goes on to have a stellar uh, career. He goes on to be a pilot. Uh, uh, he goes on to be, this is a brother right here. He goes on to be a, a, a politician and all sorts of stuff, man. He, he's just an amazing black man, you know, and this is what our brothers did now. 
I'm going to open it up. I know there's some guys who want to share some information about the Civil War, but um, I'd like to hear what you guys have to say about this. But in the meantime, make sure you contribute to the Super Chat, uh, the Cash App, and the PayPal if you appreciate this. Um, anybody who wants to join this conversation, the link is in the chat room right now. So uh, come on in. We got some time to talk. I would love to hear what you guys have to say about this subject. I think it's interesting. In my opinion, I do. I hope you guys appreciate what we're doing here. But think about that, man. 40,000 black men died uh, in, in war combat. And another 30,000 died. That's a lot of black men. Right. And another 30,000 died from like illness for a total of 70,000 and 170 and 179,000 black men served in the Civil War. And that's just on the Union side. Again, you got other black men who served on the uh, the. Uh, oh, man, look at you looking clean, man. What's happening, brother? Can you can you hear me, Pablo? Uh oh, Pablo, can you hear yes, me? Yes, yes, yes. All right, you man, you're looking clean, man. How's it going today, brother? Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, um, stepping out on a little while, but I wanted to look my best. So, so I'm here for an occasion that I should look my best because I'm That's taking good. pride in what I'm about to show you. All right, what you got, man? Let's hear it. So, it's so fitting that you're having this discussion about black men in the Civil War, and mm -hmm. I got so excited when I saw it because I am a descendant of a black man who served in the Union Army in the Civil War. And that man's name. Oh, Lord, where you go, brother? Come on back, man. Uh, I, I guess you must have clicked the button. He, he cut off when he was going to tell us what the, what his, his ancestor's name was. Come on back in. Uh, I don't know what happened. Pablo, I want to I want you to get back in here. OK, there's Pablo now. All right. Are right, you back, brother? Okay, I, hit, I hit the wrong button. Don't worry about it. Well, tell us, tell us about it. Tell us about it. So, my third great grandfather mm -hmm. is a man by the name of Gabriel Wharton. Okay. And I came across him on through Ancestry.com. I was, you know, building my family tree on Ancestry.com, and I hit okay. a roadblock, like a lot of. Black Americans do, uh -huh. where I, I didn't uh, know where else to go. And a lady who happened to be an amateur genealogist, she was very professional at doing genealogies, tracking documents and, and information to find out who your ancestors are. All right. And she went into my family tree and traced it all the way back to, to slavery, to, mm -hmm. to pre-Civil War era. Okay. And I, the farthest I went back was this man's mother who was born into slavery. Okay. Um, I don't where recall was, her name at the moment, but I did have it. Where was, it, where was Gabriel Wharton? Where's your answer? How do you spell that name? Gabriel, is it G-A-B-R-I-E-L, the biblical and, Gabriel, yes. Okay, and is it W-H-A-R-T-O-N? Yes, like the Wharton School of Business. Okay, and, and and so tell us about. I mean, what do you know about him? What year was he? What year did he die? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't have it in front of me, but I have the document that I want to share with you. And here it is. Wow, that's him. No, that's uh, on the right is my my maternal grandfather. Okay, and I'll get into him in a second. But the document it, it, on that looks that looks like a, a World War II era uh, uniform. It is. Okay. The, the document on the left, and I'm going to blow it up a little bit. Okay. The document on the left is an enlistment company descriptive book. Wow. And if you see at the top, it says Gabriel Wharton. It says Gabriel Wharton. It says 10th, what is that, the 10th Regiment? U.S. What does that yes, say? 10th Regiment, U.S. Colored Infantry. Wow. Okay, okay. Company descriptive book. It gives his age. He was 22 years old. Uh-huh. He was five foot seven and a half inches tall. I was tall back then, but go ahead. Dark complexion, black hair, black eyes. 
He was born in Accomack County, Virginia. That's where my father is from. So this mm -hmm. is my father's grandfather. Wow. Right? Or great grandfather. Wow. So now, in the death regiment, isn't that wasn't that didn't they eventually become they turned into the uh Buffalo the, soldiers? I believe so. Wow, man. So a little bit about the 10th Regiment. The 10th United States Colored Infantry was an infantry regiment that served in the Union Army during the during the American Civil War. Uh, the regiment was composed of African American enlisted men commanded by white by white, white officers and was authorized by the Bureau of Colored Troops which was created by the United States War Department on May 22nd, 1863. So remember Robert Smalls, the guy we were just talking about, because of uh -huh. that, he was able to go to Congress and that helped convince uh, Congress to change that rule of barring blacks. So wow. your, your, your great, so this, my God, this is your great, great grandfather. Yeah, my great, third great grandfather. Yeah, great, great, great grandfather. Yeah, able to join because of the actions of Robert Smalls and other valued black men. So there's a depth, the direct, there's direct a direct correlation. correlation between you and this man that we're reading about. I mean, you can reach back and touch that. Yeah, you know man. What I'm saying, man, isn't that great, Pablo? You man, can that back. fills me with so much pride every time I see this document. Yeah. Um, and this document was created because they have kind of like a muster. Uh -huh. kind of a document that the military created every so many months to, you know, have an accounting of who was there and yeah. uh, make sure didn't nobody desert or anything like that. Right. And, me, and my great grandfather, great, great, great grandfather got promoted. If you look down, at the, if you look down at the bottom where it says remarks, uh -huh. it says promoted to corporal on okay. October 16th, 1865. Wow. So not only was he in the military, he was beginning to excel and obtain rank. So so I want I want you to I'm going to give you some more history. I don't know how much you went in, but but for everybody to know, the 10th of the US Colored Infantry was organized at, at Camp Craney Island in Virginia. So it makes sense. Yes. Right? Yes. Getting November 18th, 1863. Where's your document say he went in at? What's what day did he go in on? Uh let's see. June, 20, June 22nd, 1864. 1864. So, he, mm -hmm. so he was about seven months after it, it was mustered and okay, and, and mustered in for three years service under the command of uh, Colonel Spencer H. Stafford. The regiment was attached to Drummondstown, Virginia, Department of Virginia and North Carolina, December 1863 to 1864. First Brigade, Hicks Color Division, uh, uh, department. Okay, so yeah, it's just kind of going in. Now the camp, I mean, wow, you know, so the commanders that he was under, and if you got a signature there, you had two commanders, Colonel Spencer H. Stafford and Colonel Elias Wright. Let's see if that, I it mean, says I Wright. it says wow. right at the bottom. Wow. So Colonel, let's read a little bit about Colonel Elias Wright, because, you know, this is, this is who your ancestors studied under. Elias Wright, June 22nd, 1830, January, and he died. Uh, this man just he just died in, in, in 1901. I mean, wow. I know that's 120 years ago, but I was born in 1974. So this is not odd years. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Was a Union Army officer uh, during the American Civil War. Elias was born in Durham, New York. On June 22nd, 1830, he was a surveyor and civil engineer before the Civil War. Right service started as a second lieutenant in the 4th New Jersey Volunteer Infantry Regiment on August 19, 1861. He was promoted to first lieutenant on January 31st, 1862, and was captured at the Battle of Gaines Mill on June 27, 1862 in exchange. He was promoted to captain on December 29th, 1862. Wright was appointed major of the 1st United States Colored Infantry. Now, let me tell you something. Elias had to have volunteered for that. So this uh -huh. lets you know what type of man he was. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, June 25th, 1863. And he would have been the one in charge of promoting uh, your ancestor. Wow. And Lieutenant Colonel April 29th, 1864, he was appointed to the colored. He was appointed Colonel of the 10th United States Colored Infantry on August 15th, 1864. Was this a colored man or, or a white man? He right. was a white man. Remember, all the all the uh, okay. all the, 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 the commanding officers commander was white. Right. And he was a brigade command of, of brigade the second division the third. Um, uh, it just goes on in uh, 
he just talks about you know how how far he went on february 5th 1865 president lincoln nominated wright for appointment to to the grade of wow brigadier general to rank from january 15 1865 the united states senate confirmed the appointment uh march 1865 wright resigned his commission on june 17 1865 after the war he was a civil engineer and a land agent in atlantic city new jersey elias died atlantic city on january 2nd 1901 he was buried at greenwood cemetery in pleasantville new jersey i bet his family probably has photographs wow of, of the regiment his, yeah of his regiment i bet if you got his family you got hold of his family you can probably look him up because he's a famous guy and find I photos bet, i bet they have photos old family photos and you probably could find a photograph of your ancestor wow with him. I bet I bet that would happen. Or you would see a picture of him standing up in front of his color regiment. Wow. And, and you I, know what? Um my my third my great great grandfather survived the Civil War mm -hmm. uh, because he remarried. He, his wife died and uh -huh. he remarried after the war. So he was alive. He survived the war. Wow. So man, that's amazing. I'm putting the link here in the in, in our private section, man. That's use that to you know maybe find get some more information if you're really interested in, in, in okay in looking at what you're at but that's an amazing story brother you thank you saying? for allowing me to share and uh man i, I just i'm so happy when i when i found mm -hmm. this and it fills me with pride that's why when yeah. i hear women saying crazy stuff oh black men ain't never built nothing right. you ain't never you you conquered and all of that i'm i just laugh because i know none of it is true um and the gentleman that you saw in uniform on the right is my mm -hmm. mother's father, my grandfather, right. Right. Uh, James Perry. Mm -hmm. James Perry was a part of what's called the Montford Point Marines. The Montford Point Marines. Montford Point uh, Black men were not allowed to be in the Marine Corps prior mm -hmm. to World War II. Mm -hmm. it, was in, it was in 1941 that they were allowed to become Marines. Reason being, they believe that black men would be cowardice. Now, now, see, here's the problem with that. And, and see, here's the problem with that. Okay, so they did well in in the Revolutionary War, right? You commended them. You wouldn't have won the war without black men. You wouldn't have won the Civil War without them. You, you, no, we ain't got there yet. We talking about the Revolutionary War in right. 1776. You wouldn't have won that war without black folks. You tried it. It didn't work. You had to bring in black men to fight. The War of 1812 happened. You said you didn't want black men. You tried it, it didn't work. You had to bring black men in. Now let's move Civil War. You were getting your butt kicked by the Southerners because you didn't want black men. You tried it, it didn't work. You had to bring black men in. And now, World War II, you tried to do it without black men. You tried it, it didn't work again. And so you had to bring black men because you was getting your butt kicked. Now we get up to Civil War and you say, oh, no, we don't want these black men. As if as if Colonel Ty never existed uh, from from the Revolutionary War, uh, uh, the War of 1812. He was wearing those white folks out in New Jersey and the Revolutionary War that we talked about, all those great heroes, uh, the, the, the Civil War, Robert Smalls. What are you talking about? You see what I'm saying? They they're lying. You see what I'm saying? They're lying, 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 lying. lying. But and yeah. my, my grandfather, yeah. my mother's father, he was a Montfort Point Marine. And like I said, they did not believe because the Marine Corps are the, the troops who hit the beach when they invade a, a foreign nation. That right. is their job. And so mm -hmm. it is assumed that you will be the first in to fight and receive the most violent reprisal right mm -hmm. so their their theory was that colored men black men cannot operate a rifle they will cower when when faced with this kind of uh of ferocious fighting they wouldn't survive it they they would run away and so my grandfather was uh, uh among the first yeah. black men ever enlisted in the marine corps and he served man. world war ii but see the crazy thing is man we have a whole history of black men fighting. I mean, the, the British had us. I mean, it's just lies that that official policy is tone deaf to what a, a history of black men fighting valiantly. 
I mean, think about it. They awarded 12 medals of honor to these colored troops who fought, you know, in that one, in that one, uh, 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 in, in, in the 10th, uh, not the 10th, in, in, in that one regiment. And so this is what we have to do, brother. See, if you allow them to get away with these uh, tropes, if you allow them to hold their cop, the next one, they probably say right now, you black dudes don't fight well enough. Well, well, tell them about the history. I want you to pull up this history of black men in the U.S. military. Every time, and just tag who all the clowns on it to have bad things to say about black men and then we what we will and won't do. You just tag them on it. But thank you so much, brother. I appreciate this conversation. All right, man. I'm, Great. I'm inspired, back. man. Uh, but thank you so much, man. Look, if you guys appreciate what I'm doing, I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Pablo. I appreciate him coming in and sharing his family. And to be able to corroborate that and give a little bit more historical facts on it, I think it's important. But all the black military servicemen, you guys who are out there right now, you come from a long line of, 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 of valiant service, a long history of valiant service uh, in all branches of, of, of the United States military. Uh, Navy, Army, uh, and we had to fight our way in. And, and 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 not only when they did that, they did an excellent job once they got in. So you guys keep that in mind. But these, when these guys say black men calling, that's just a damn lie. And they don't even believe it because they've seen the doctor. They just like to dwell on that. That's like having a pretty girl telling her she's ugly. Girl, you ain't that pretty. You ain't get, you know, damn well, she's fine as wine in the summertime but you keep telling her she's ugly to try to mess with her self-esteem. Black men have been some of the hardest fighting men in this country from day one. So you don't, you guys don't ever let anybody doubt uh, what black men did in the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and all these other wars that they drafted us to fight in because we did an excellent job at it, man. So either way, man, I appreciate you guys. Y'all make sure you contribute to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. Y'all been kind of light on the cash app and the PayPal. Now, there's one more thing I want to go over with you guys. There's a couple more heroes I want to talk about because I think it's important. I think it's, uh, but I, I need you guys to make sure you contribute to the super chat. Uh, make sure you show your appreciation for what I'm doing, the time I'm taking to put this up here and lay it all right out here by contributing. That's all I want you guys to do. In addition to that, I need you to hit the number one button right now. Go ahead and hit that number one button right now and let me know you appreciate what I'm doing here. Okay, guys. Remember, we talked Salem poor. That's one guy I wanted to talk about. I think I might, I think I actually might do some 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 more work. So I'm I'm gonna isolate some individual black heroes. Okay, because remember your war heroes back in the day, that was your Michael Jordan. OK, those those war heroes that that was your uh, those were those were your superstars of the game. All right. So it's important that we, we have that. Uh, the next time we talk, we're going to talk about World War One. And you definitely got some heroes in there. But I need you guys to make sure if you want to keep this going. Otherwise, I'm going to have to talk about something else because we only got 63 people in the chat room. Um, if you guys want me to keep this going, uh, you know, and, and keep this topic going, I had to stop talking about uh, fighting style, African fighting, warrior culture, because the brothers weren't uh, contributing and y'all weren't participating. That's why I, I stopped. I, I haven't even done the 52 blocks because, you know, you guys don't seem to like it. The way I know you like it is participation and contributions. I want to give you what you want. I want to give you what you're asking for. And the way you show your appreciation is by contributions and then also so i put the 52 blocks african warrior code we talked about remember if you guys were here we talked about uh, the black uh samurais we talked about all those uh those different fighting styles in africa but i put it on hold because guys weren't participating i feed off your energy you know what you like i want to give it to you you see what i'm saying if you appreciate it then show your appreciation by contributing to the super chat the cash app and the paypal thank you so much one truck iceman thank you i appreciate all the um i appreciate all the truckers across the road um thank you so much for that uh thank you volcanoes i appreciate you you guys you got to make sure you contribute if you want me to keep this going you like this if this makes you feel good if this makes you proud of your heritage as black men then you gotta you gotta give to it otherwise i 
I got to talk about, you know, stuff that uh, whatever, whatever the latest thing Kwame Brown said. Uh, Y'all like that. I get plenty of, I get plenty of covers. I get plenty of folks uh, when, when I, when I list that name, or I have to say what Kevin Samuels told some woman, you know what I'm saying? Those are the, those are the things that, to get people on the page, to get my sus subscriptions up. This is stuff I actually enjoy, you know? And so I need you guys to show your appreciation by contributing. Okay, guys, you gotta make sure you contribute to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. Uh, big shout out to Toot Rev 211 thank you so much. This is how we keep this going. And if you do, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do some specials on, I did Robert Smalls already, Right, you guys can look through my uh, roller decks of videos and see that. But I'd like to do a, a extensive on Colonel Ty. Okay, you guys remember him? I'd like to do a, do some work on him. Uh, I'd like to work on um, who else? Uh, Salem Poor. Right, I want to work with him, and then also Peter Salem. Um, there's some other great war heroes, black American. I mean, we always talk about the Haitian warriors and, and, and shout out to the brothers from Haiti. They put that fight in, but we got our own heroes. You see what I'm saying? And I think it's better for black men, especially black American men, if we begin to discuss our own black heroes so that they become commonly known amongst us so that when people say stuff like black men don't contribute, black men don't build, we can hit them with the facts. Just like in court, best thing to do when people start talking, bam, hit them with the facts. Just keep hitting them with the facts until they fold. You see, hit them with the facts. And that's what I want to do. I want you guys to be able to hit them with all these facts, right? Give them, what do you young brothers say? Give them that smoke. And so in order to keep that going, in order for us to do it, because see, there's nothing like having a response to some of these silly remarks. You see, there's nothing like having a response when people say crazy things about reputation because they want you to they want you to feel bad just like those silly military men always oh you black guys you're going to run under pressure black men don't run under pressure we fight with the best of them been doing it for a long time and so that's what you guys are learning right here you see you're learning what what these brothers have done you see and you should be proud of it you know i i support military service i support black men uh, uh, entering into the military, uh, fighting not only for their country, but fighting for a cause bigger than themselves. I support that. Most of my family members have, have had military service, Army, Navy, and the Marine Corps, right? I don't know any in the Air Force, but but bottom line is I support that. And um, I think you do yourself a disservice by not knowing the history of the military, all right? So um, you guys make sure you contribute to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal if you want me to keep this particular series up. Um, you know, if you like this, then, then, then we'll continue to do it. Shout out to Darius Harper. I love the Black American War lessons. Yeah, okay, cool. Well, if you guys like it, I love it. We'll keep it going. But you got to contribute. You can't just sit there and watch and then uh, let me do all this work, sweating it out, <laughs> trying not to embarrass myself. You see what I mean? You got to go ahead and contribute. You got to do that. That's important for y'all to do. Uh, but in the meantime, guys, I um, appreciate everybody. This has been a great conversation. I'm going to leave this open. I'm not going to make this members only because you guys have contributed. And I want you guys to use this. I want you to share it. I want you to talk about it. I appreciate everybody who's contributed to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. And other than that, I want to salute all the military veterans, all the black military veterans. I want to say thank you for your service. You come from a long line of valiant um, fighting men in the United States, black American men. I appreciate you guys. I think anybody with any sense will appreciate you guys uh, for what you've done. Know your history. Know who you know what you've done. Know your history um, and, and take that with you. But other than that, this is Uncle D. I'm out.